Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the sixth edition of the Human Rights Weekend. And very well, uh, warm welcome as well to this panel discussion on challenges and opportunities for environmental activists. Uh, my name is Sahar Yadagari, and I will be your moderator for this session. I work as a program manager at Adesium Foundation, which is a Dutch philanthropy organization that aspires to an open democratic society in which people live in harmony with each other and their environments. Um, uh, during this session, we will be exploring the world of environmental activism, and we are facing many environmental problems today. Um, climate change, air pollution, destruction of forests, uh, decline of biodiversity, um, and these environmental crises will increasingly impact the lives, health, and livelihood of people around the world. Uh, fortunately, there are activists and ordinary citizens, perhaps like yourselves, uh, who are fighting and doing the best they can to protect the environment, uh, to defend their right to land, to clean air, clean, uh, a clean environment, basically. Uh, this type of activ activism can, however, be quite risky. Uh, environmental activists may uh, face harassment, uh, intimidation, and in some cases, even deadly violence. Uh, during this session, we will be exploring the uh, opportunities and challenges involved with uh, environmental activism and also um, investigate the connection between human rights and the environment. And of course, we will also address uh, what we can do as individuals to make a difference. We are very happy that you've chosen this uh, panel discussion to participate in, and we hope that it will meet your expectations. I can assure you that we have se selected a very knowledgeable panel here today and they are eager to share with you their first-hand and, uh, and personal, uh, often personal experiences on life as an environmental activist. I will give the floor to our panelists as soon as possible, but before doing so, just a few uh, comments about the structure of this session. Uh, we will start with a brief overview of uh, environmental activism. Uh, Marcos Orellana, who's sitting right over there, he is the Divisions Director of Environment and Human Rights Division uh, within Human Rights Watch. He will give us a general understanding of the topic, and then our panelists uh, uh, will present themselves uh, and each share with you uh, their story as an activist. Uh, I will then ask them a couple of questions to explore um, those challenges and opportunities. Uh, for instance, on litigation, using litigation as a tool, uh, technology and what opp opportunities it may bring, um, and last but not least, mobilization and the role of the public. Uh, we will then give the floor to you uh, and, and you can uh, ask your questions. I know the panelists are really looking forward to hearing from you, so please do share with us your questions later on during this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but first I would like to introduce Marcos. Um, Marcos grew up in Chile uh, and uh, studying law in a time when the Pinochet era was coming to an end. He became soon aware of the new issues of his time one being uh, the battle of indigenous people uh, who were losing their land for corporate purposes. So he became involved with that issue and has remained on the path of uh, environmental activism ever since. <laughs> he uh, has a PhD in law and um, he teaches, um, uh, let me look, uh, oh, he's associate professor at the George Washington University Law School, teaching international environmental law. Uh, he used to work as a senior attorney for the Center for International Environmental Law, and he represented the Eight Nation, uh, also known as the Independent Association of Latin America and the Caribbean, for the negotiations of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and currently the Director of Environments and Human Rights within Human Rights Watch. Please, Marcos, would you give us that general overview? Thank you, thank you, Sahar, uh, for that kind of introduction. I'm delighted to be with you here today, uh, back in Amsterdam, uh, to share the news that uh, Human Rights Watch has established a new <coughs> Environment and Human Rights Division. This is a big step for a human rights organization. It, this program is the only one of its kind in a major human rights organization, and it reflects a simple but yet powerful idea that we can only enjoy a life of dignity in an environment that is clean. The recognition of the basic fact 
that without clean air, without clean water, we cannot enjoy our fundamental rights. As Sahar mentioned, I started working on these issues uh, in the early 1990s back in, in Chile. At the time, democracy was coming back and Chile was confronting the human rights challenge of dealing with the legacy of Pinochet's dictatorship. I was involved in uh, early efforts at bringing international humanitarian law to prosecute for crimes against humanity the perpetrators of atrocities. But soon in that struggle it became clear that human rights issues were not just dealing with the past, they were also looking at the future. And the plight of indigenous peoples that were defending their land and their territories soon showed that environment and human rights, for them, they were indissoluble. They were clearly connected, not isolated ideas or concepts or silos. The artificial separation of human rights and the environment uh, through separate tracks at that time gave way to increasing synergies. And if in the early 1990s these environmental rights issues were novel, today it, they have become an element of our present time. And so the environment and human rights division brings the strength of the human rights methodology to support the environmental cause. So where people are exposed to toxic chemicals, where people are threatened with displacement because climate change renders their land inarable or because of uh, large hydroelectric dams or deforestation, or where people are targeted for their environmental activism, EHR will investigate and expose those issues of environmental degradation that result in human rights infringements. So to illustrate these ideas, a brief video. <laughs> Not all environmental issues are human rights issues, however. There is a conceptual challenge there. And for that reason, the new Environment and Human Rights Division, in order to have an impact, has selected three priority areas, working on first, toxics and chemical pollution, second, climate change and human rights, and third, environmental defenders, which is the topic yeah. of uh, today's panel. Yeah. And so I thought I would say a word about that. Uh, it has become a global problem. The Guardian, working in partnership with an organization partner, Global Witness, has last week reported that 197 environmental activists have been murdered during 2017. And that figure is quite similar to 2016, where over 200 environmentalists were murdered. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. As Sahar mentioned, there's criminalization of environmental activists, criminalization of protests, criminalization of indigenous leaders, there's threats, 
attacks, harassment, uh, there's abuse of uh, litigation. It is becoming a global problem. People that mobilize against deforestation are targeted. People that mobilize against large dams, they are targeted. People that defend community lands, they are targeted. People that defend climate, they are targeted. Extractive industries. The slide that we have on screen relates to a, uh, an event that we organized in the last conference of the parties of the Climate Convention. It shows how indigenous peoples from around the world came together in Bonn last year to say we're the guardians of the forest. We cannot solve the climate problem if the forest continue to be cut. And yet we are also quite concerned that in the lead up to the next conference of the parties that will take in Poland this year, Poland has just adopted a law restricting rights of protest allowing for surveillance and personal information, so all with an attempt to restrict the civic society space that is needed for civil society to play its critical role in providing information to the public, in providing information to the media and policy makers. So I wanted to show this slide of um, memory of Berta Cáceres. She was um, an indigenous woman with the Lenca people in Honduras <coughs> fighting against the so-called Agua Sarca Dam in the lands of her people. And for her activism, she was murdered in cold blood. The assassins entered her house and shot her. Uh, to this day, this was in 2016, to this day there was, there has been no credible investigation, no the perpetrators are still at large. She has become a symbol of the environmental movement and environmental activism in the fight against environmental destruction. This is Phyllis Omido. She's an environmentalist from Kenya that began to mobilize her community when she learned that her son had been poisoned by lead, lead contamination that was coming out of a battery recycling facility located at doorsteps of her community. For that effort, she was vilified by local politicians, labeled as an anti-development, anti-democracy, anti-patriot, but she resorted to strong advocacy at the local level and at the international level, grounding it on respect for the right to a healthy environment. And that has helped her strengthen her case, strengthen her community, and have monumental wins before the courts. And the last slide I want to show is that of, if we can get it to move, of Isidro Valdenegro. He's an indigenous Tarahumara and from the Sierra Madre in Mexico. He was murdered about this time last year for defending the last remaining forests uh, in his uh, territory. His father before him had been involved in activism and his father, like him, was also murdered by logging in interests. We are seeing that this is becoming a global problem, a serious issue of concern. And for concluding, I thought I'd lay out a couple reasons. Why is this happening? What, what are the root causes of, of this problem? And I, I'll lay out three, three ideas and three reasons. One, corruption. And I'm sure Silas will talk more about this, so I, will, don't, I won't dwell on that. Uh, a second reason is the unfinished business of conquest. This sovereignty and the nation state in many parts of the world is a veneer. But underneath that fiction, there is a raging battle over territory where corporations and communities are fighting tooth and nail, communities usually for their life. And as we've seen here, environmental activists are ending up dead. And then the third reason that I'll pose to you is that despite the promise of the new paradigm of sustainable development back in 1992, you may recall the big earth summit at the time, the largest gathering of human history, despite the promise of participatory decision making that would put an end to vertical decisions where decisions would be taken in capitals or international financial institutions, the World Bank, 
that they would involve communities, that promise is failing. The tools for meaningful participation are not there. And where communities don't get to participate in the democratic dialogue that leads to decisions, then we have environmental conflict. And as a result, threats, attacks, and harassment of environmental activists. So I'll stop there, uh, only to point out that greater awareness does matter. For example, as a result of the international campaign, the Dutch Development Bank decided to divest from the Agua Sarca Dam in Honduras. And that's an important step. Uh, the Norwegian Wealth Fund is now considering divesting from oil and gas, also in recognition of uh, climate change and human rights linkages. So I will stop all thanking you all uh, for the incredible support that uh, this new division has received and also per to participate in the debate later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very impressive. And we will address these topics later on during the discussion uh, as well. I would now like to introduce Donald, who is sitting uh, next to me. Donald is the director of um, Friends of the Earth in the Netherlands, also known as uh, Milieu Defensi. He has a long and impressive track record as an environmental campaigner, uh, working for uh, World Wildlife Fund both in the Netherlands, in China, and, interna and internationally. And he was also a global sustainability expert at the Energy Research Center. According to his LinkedIn profile, he is a climate optimist. So we are looking forward to hearing from him why that is the case and uh, why we should be optimists as well, perhaps. Uh, Donald, welcome. Let's start at the beginning. Could you please share with us um, what motivated you to do this? Um, when did you decide to go into this line of business? Yeah, yeah it's, it's nice to have this type of uh, uh, discussions. And thank you for inviting me. Well, because you get these questions, and then you're forced to reflect on where, what the origin of your activism uh, is. Some of you that probably recognize my accent. I'm South African uh, from origin. And um, <laughs> um, so I, f I feel a close bond with my fellow African uh, seagull. Um, and to be honest, I, I grew up in the, in the time at the end of apartheid, but uh, uh, when apartheid was still uh, uh, alive and kicking. And um, one of my first conscious uh, memories uh, of growing up was when the police arrived at the gates of our, of our farm. Mm. And they were, wanted to pick up one of the uh, ladies that worked on our farm, a black lady, uh, because she didn't have a permit. And my, my uh, parents refused to hand over uh, this, uh, this uh, lady. And for me, what, what I can always still remember is the, the absolute fear of this lady because she was hiding in our kitchen. Uh, because she didn't want to be taken uh, away by, by the police because of what could happen to her. Um, and at the same time, the resistance of my, my parents, because they also ran some, some risk, of course, in no way comparable to the risk of the lady that could be uh, uh, arrested. And um, for me, it was the, the, the com combination of, on the one hand, being in a privileged position, because let me be clear, I, I was white and, uh, and my parents also, clearly, I think, <laughs> in, uh, in South Africa, and therefore in the, in, in the position of privilege. Uh, but also that privilege provides you of the, with the opportunity to act, um, to resist oppression. And later when I grew up, I, I s grown to, to realize that there's a relation in the oppression of people, mm -hmm. which is a resource by, for, for government and companies, and, the, and uh, uh, exploitation of na nature as a natural re resource. And often if you see, and I, get, I guess Silas will give us a much more um, intense description of that, that oppression is, is on both, both the people and nature, both seen as a resource yeah. to be exploited to increase the wealth of the few. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, if you look, at, look back at your uh, life as a campaigner uh, up until now, what accomplishments are you most proud of? Um, well, to be honest, uh, as, as a grassroots organization, we have a lot to be proud of. And as, a, as director, I often say uh, I have, I, I have the, the nice position that I can claim the credits of what other people do. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to mention um, at least two. 
the first is that, uh, the, um, that the European Union now regulates the import of timber uh, and has declared uh, un illegal timber illegal in Europe. And that sounds, of course, strange, but there was a t time, decades, that illegal timber could just be imported. Uh, uh, yeah. And that's very much a result of the campaigning that Friends of the Earth in, uh, in Europe did, in collaboration with our partners uh, in, in Africa and Latin America. And another is, a bit more recently, uh, was the court case that um, we won against Shell, mm. the multinational yeah. Shell. Yeah. Uh, who did a lot of polluting activities in Nigeria. Yeah. And um, uh, while our Nigerian office won a lot of court cases against uh, Shell, the government did not implement the, uh, the results of those court cases. <laughs> so we then took Shell to court in the Netherlands and the, and, the, and the judge had to decide if it's possible to take a multinational to the Dutch court for activities they do in Nigeria, yeah. and we yeah. won uh, yeah. that case, yeah. which yeah. is an enormous breakthrough because it means that now we, as Dutch people, can also take uh, multinationals to, uh, to, to court for what they do in developing countries. Yeah. That is indeed amazing. Yeah. So why should we uh, be climate optimists? Uh, I have a bit of a philosophical background, and I believe in uh, what some of you would recognize in Hegel, the thesis, antithesis, uh, and synthesis, that uh, growth in society has always, always been the result of people confronting uh, injustice. Um, and by confronting injustice, uh, we are always, as, as uh, humans, victorious. Uh, and by confronting and being victorious, uh, our civilization grows. Uh, and the fact that, that we, are, we, are, we are part of, or we can choose to be a member of team number one. And team number one is nature. If we, if, we, uh, 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 if we connect with the nature in us, the potential for growth, uh, for autonomy, for recognition of our shared humanity, and use that to confront injustice, it will always bring us further. And so we will uh, conquer climate change also. Wow. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to ask who is a climate optimist here, <laughs> although if you want to share later on. Um, so let's move to Silas. Um, welcome all the way from Liberia. Uh, I should mention that you are here alone, but it's, uh, there's an entire community of activists behind you who have had a crucial role in achieving the results that we're about to discuss. So it's important to acknowledge their contribution uh, as well. Uh, you have campaigned on community rights in the natural resource sector and forest governance since 2000. Uh, and you founded the Sustainable Development Institute in Liberia. Um, you have been awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2006, a prize that honors uh, grassroots, grassroots environmental heroes. Uh, and your work has been portrayed in the documentary Silas. And this is directed by filmmaker Anjali Nayar with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as executive producer. And the film shows uh, your battle uh, against illegal logging in Liberia. Uh, and it's, it exposes the relationship between the extraction of resources and the financing of corrupt regimes and also the role of Western companies. The film is aired here tonight, later on at 8.30. I would absolutely recommend it if you have time. Um, so welcome. Uh, perhaps start with the same question to you as well. Um, when did you realize you wanted to become an activist um, and, and why? Uh, well, uh, it's good to be here and uh, thanks to everyone uh, for taking the time off. Um, I should start by saying I actually uh, grew up in an environment in which uh, the impact of corruption was very real on my household. Um, as a young person, I went to a school where there were no benches, there were no decks. Um, you sat on the broken rocks, for example. You had to do your nose on your lap. Um, so I grew up with the impact of corruption. So when I later on got to realize that that is what it is called, uh, then I said, well, this is unacceptable because basically what I had to endure as a child um, I thought that other children should not uh, be forced to live with that. Um, so fast track a little bit into the 2000s, I 
also was confronted with a very uh, difficult situation. We had just elected uh, a former warlord, uh, Charles Taylor, in 1997. Um, he was using timber uh, revenue to do uh, lots of bad things. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dutch National, uh, Gus Van Kuwenhoven, was also a part of that network. The good news is that the Dutch government is the only government so far that has held anybody accountable for human rights abuses in Liberia, and that is uh, in the person yeah. of God. Yeah. Um, so my uh, interest has been very much uh, deeply personal, uh, but also for the wider interest of the community where I grew up, and uh, being surrounded by uh, companies and government actors uh, taking advantage of ordinary people um, to exploit their environment in ways that also impact on them um, has really driven the desire in me to work towards uh, how we can balance the skill and uh, reverse some of the, the damages that have been done and also to empower people to take uh, actions at the community level but also to challenge the government to do better to manage our natural resources because that is what our country depends on as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is really interesting about your story is that you worked really hard to uh, gather evidence against Charles Taylor and that was very successful. Um, he was sanctioned, sentenced, uh, and there was a new president uh, who promised change and an end to corruption. And uh, you actually voted for this candidate, you believed in her, uh, only to find out later on that the legal logging uh, was continuing, the corruption was continuing. Um, so perhaps the question is how to keep faith in a situation like that? How do you remain optimistic about the outcome? Well, like, uh uh, Donna, I think uh, when you look back, you do see uh, some very positive developments in the midst of all of the challenges that we have to live with. Um, very recently, there was no space for civil society, for example, to directly engage the government to be a part of policy making processes. That has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, monitoring logging activities, trying to document uh, what the timber companies were doing, what they were taking out, exporting and the trade. Um, you had to do that covertly. Now you don't have to do that anymore. Um, you can walk into the forestry department and ask for information and they are under obligation to pass on uh, that information to you. In the past, uh, communities the only thing they benefited from the logging companies were the dust that they left behind when their trailers went to their villages. Now, by law, communities have a right to 30% of the revenue that's generated from logging in their company. So we have seen some very important uh, changes, and that continues to inspire us to try to do more. Yeah. Because in spite of the positive developments that I'm describing, there are also some very difficult uh, situations that a lot of people still have to live with. Um, for example, uh, in spite of the very good reform measures that we worked with the past government to put into place, very quickly they began to uh, roll back the reform, moving the, the laying foundations that were there, removing the bricks one by one. Um, and one big example, a uh, very good example I can uh, talk about is uh, in 2010, when they started to give out what became a very infamous, the private use permits for logging. Mm -hmm. um, in two years, more than 25, about 25% of Liberia's forests are being allocated using these permits. Um, we campaigned against that uh, for two years, and within the third year, the president realized that it had to sh she had to shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, that was shut down, the timber companies went to court, um, they lost, um, and we were able to maintain uh, the moratorium up to today is still uh, in force. So when you look back and see these very uh, positive developments mm -hmm. that would not have been possible if you were not engaged, if you were not involved, then you say to yourself not to engage is not an option. You have to remain engaged and yeah. continue to push. Yeah. Um, speaking of positive developments, or perhaps not so positive, it's up to you. Um, you have decided to go into politics, and you actually uh, were a candidate <laughs> during the um, general elections in Liberia in October 2017. 
Um, how do you, perhaps you could share with us what motivates you to do so and how you envision your role in the future? Well, it's uh, difficult to be on the outside mm -hmm. and uh, influence a lot on the inside. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of uh, other incoming politicians say that all the time. Um, but I think uh, 15 years of working as an activist on the outside um, and wanting to move on to take my fight to another level, I felt that um, it would be very important to engage uh, in parliamentary uh, yep. discussions around these issues because that's where most of the political decisions that impact on the environment on natural resources are made. Um, and so, in 2015, I stepped down from the organization that I started at Move On, um, and now I am an independent, uh, 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 not a partisan, <laughs> but an independent political actor. Okay. So with that, I can engage, and I'm engaging and uh, uh, writing commentaries about uh, topical issues. Um, with an environmental and community rights uh, less yep. on all the time. Um, so I'm hoping that going forward, I will remain engaged um, in those type of activities. And hopefully, um, there will come a time that I will have my opportunity um, to be in the system Great. and to work from within. Yes, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, our last guest, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence used to work as a police detective um, specialized in environmental crime here in the Netherlands, but then changed things completely and uh, joined the Sea Shepherd and tried to stop whale hunting. After this experience, he co-founded the Shadow View Foundation, uh, an organization that uses innovative technology uh, for conversation and, uh, conservation and environmental projects around the world. In 2017, you and your team won the uh, World Wildlife Fund Human, Wa Human Wildlife's Conflict Tech Challenge um, uh, with your high-tech solution for smart parks, and we're going to talk about that later on during this discussion. Um, uh, he's also the author of the book uh, Hunting the Hunters at War with the, wh with the Whalers. I would also recommend um, his TEDx talk. Uh, it's called A Wildlife Rebel with a Cause. Very interesting. His most memorable encounter was the day when a Japanese harpoon vessel uh, rammed and sunk his ship. Uh, and we have a small clip of that encounter, uh, which we can look at right now, if possible. I can't really see what's going on. I thought they hit them. Get some binoculars. Get some binoculars. Um, you see? She's got her water cannon going. I can't see it. Yep, she got hit. You don't come down here believing that you're going to die. But you come down here realizing you put your life on the line. Where's Pete? Still on board? Yeah, still, he's still on board. Pete has beaten up. Yeah, man, it's his ship. It's his, his life is into this ship. And you know, you don't come down here to lose your ship. And he's no. a captain, man. It's just, I don't think anyone can comprehend what Pete must have been thinking. He lost his vessel that he took around the world. It's been his baby, his child, for the last four years. It's going to be tough on him. Wow, that was welcome. Thanks. Would you like to start off with telling us about more or more about that experience? What happened? Yeah, um, well, we got rammed and sunk. <laughs> and, uh, 
But fortunately, all of us survived. But uh, we, we were in, this, in the Southern Ocean, and the Southern Ocean, um, it is pretty much no legislation uh, at the moment for, for who's to enforce the laws there. And, and Japan goes down there every year hunting uh, hundreds of whales for scientific research. And yeah, up until today, no one's really enforcing the law there, trying to protect yeah. these whales that shouldn't be hunted, because there is a ban on, uh, on whaling since 1986. And there was this organization, Sea Shepherd, that is going down there, or yeah. was going down there. Uh, and I was able to be a part of that. And uh, yeah, so before I started with Sea Shepherd, I was, uh, I was a crime investigator, and I was yeah. focused on, on criminal investigations, on, on birds of prey, and, and that kind of stuff. But it was so frustrating that every time we were doing an investigation for months on time, you know, the criminal just got away with very little punishment, but even a big fine at some occasions. And I thought, you know, I really want to feel in every fiber of my being that I'm making a difference. And that's, mm. that's when I decided to you know, screw this. And, I, and I, I gave up my job and I, I went to Australia to jump on board of the vessels. And I think, uh, hopefully, a lot of people are here thinking about, yeah, I want to do some direct action stuff. And I think this was the, the pinnacle of direct action stuff to be on the... <laughs> on the small boats and going after those harpoon vessels and really feeling that you're, you're making a difference and you're stopping those harpoon vessels as they, as they go along. And we frustrated one of them um, um, uh, quite some time because we were blocking the big factory vessel that they used to process the whales after they, they, they caught them. And uh, at some point we were running low on fuel and we had to head back north to go back to port. And so we said goodbye to our other vessels who were in the close vicinity. And, uh, but what we thought, you know, the harpoon vessel was going to pass us, but uh, he decided not to. And uh, yeah, he came to the right and, and, uh, and rammed us as, as we were looking at it. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And also, I, I can imagine many of us thinking one day that they, they should actually be doing something, but you, you went on and did it. Because after this, you founded the Skyview Foundation. Yeah, I did two things. So um, I went on to do stuff with, with Sea Shepherd for a little while longer. Yeah. And one of the things they asked me to do is, okay, in Namibia, and I don't think many people know this, is about 90,000 seals are being clubbed to death each year yeah. uh, for their fur. So people think, oh, Canada is where they club the seals, but, but Namibia is also a country where this happens a lot. And they asked me to go down there with a, with a small crew and film this, and we tried to do this with a drone. And, uh, and we did this slightly successfully. The images weren't as good as we hoped, but we were able to raise awareness about the issue. And that's where I thought, you know, this is 2011, it's like drones. Well, they can be such an asset for conservation and, and campaigning around the world. So I decided to, to found a, a Shadow View, uh, which is the, yeah. the foundation, and also a commercial company in order to fund the foundation. And, yeah. uh, and that took off. And uh, yeah, ever since, I've been focusing on using technology for, uh, for conservation issues. And how does this innovation take place, you know, just coming up with the idea and thinking, okay, it hasn't been done before, and why hasn't it been done before, and why is it that you can come up with this? Uh, what can we learn from that process? I, I think it's a combination of uh, um, being in the field and seeing what really needs to happen and having access to, you know, be, living in the Netherlands where you have great access to uh, cutting edge technology that's being developed and, and being able to combine these two things and see, okay, that, that's, this is what can really benefit us. And, and also having the experience, what, I, what we saw with the clip with Sea Shepherd, that, that vessel that was cutting at technology that was never done before, and we were able, finally able to outsmart Japanese whaling, yeah. one of the most uh, largest economical superpowers in the world. And you know, we managed to outsmart them and, and stop whaling. That's really what got me triggered. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh, move on to exploring some opportunities and challenges. Uh, and I would like to invite all of you to take part in this uh, uh, part of the discussion. Uh, let's start first with uh, litigation. Uh, Donald, you've already shared with us the Shell uh, uh, case. Um, in general, I think Milieu Defense is known for being a good litigator, in a sense, uh, going to court to um, uh, achieve better protection of the environment. Um, what are the le lessons learned so far uh, if you look at litigation as a tool in general? Um, I guess the, the first lesson is uh, that it can be very effective. Okay. Uh, I guess some of the, the Dutch audience also know about our most recent court case, uh, Court Geding, which we won uh, against government. Uh, Sorry, what was that on, one about? And that was about uh, healthy air. Right. So uh, we uh, took the Dutch government to court to implement European regulations on healthy air, yeah. clean air, and uh, we won. Unfortunately, we, 
lost the next case, uh, but now we're going into Hoge Broep, uh, so that uh, appeal. appeal. So uh, we're still uh, busy. But um, one thing is that you need to be have a, uh, a long-term commitment because it takes years. Uh, for example, the case we won against uh, Shell took us 10 years and they appealed, so it's, we're still busy. 10 years uh, and a hundred or oh, a million euro uh, in terms of court wow. costs. Um, and it's invisible, you know, a lot of work of environmental activists are out there, very important, especially some of my colleagues uh, from other organizations are very good at, at getting the attention of the general public. But a lot of work takes place behind the closed doors and need commitment and drive. Uh, so that is it, uh, you know, commitment, yeah. drive and long term uh, uh, commitment. And lots of money. And, lo and lots of money. And, and, and people like, like you that are present here today um, can make that possible. Yeah. Because also our court case against the Dutch government on uh, clean air, yeah. uh, we could only do it because of a crowdfunding uh, campaign in which people uh, paid for it. And I'd say a second uh, lesson learned is uh, while litigation is a, is a professional uh, and, uh, activity, the, um, you need to involve the general public yeah. because that uh, ensures that you're busy with the, the, the real things to stay real. Uh, but also in a court case, it makes you more convincing. So both the examples that I used, uh, the uh, healthy air litigation, we involve people that are victims of unhealthy yeah. air. Yeah. And that uh, is an important aspect in winning the case because the judge says, OK, this is not just s some hobby of a uh, professional uh, yeah. environmental organization, but clearly real people uh, are hurt by or their health is negatively impacted by uh, pollution. And the Shell Court case was the same. We brought communities from Nigeria that, uh, um, that communities and their lands are polluted by, by Shell, who lost. It, it, these are extremely emotional stories of, of a, father, a father that told me when we met him, he was sitting at, at the, uh, next to a road selling sweets uh, as a way of income. And he was a farmer. And he, he said, I had, a, I had a good running farm. Mm -hmm. I was planning to send my kids to university uh, and then Shell polluted my farm. Yeah. Uh, I lost everything. My land is worthless. I cannot sell it. I cannot uh, farm it anymore. Um, my kids uh, uh, cannot go to university because they don't have money. But bringing those people to, to the Netherlands and putting them in the, uh, in the court to confront Shell uh, worked very actively to convince the, the judge. Yeah. So long-term yeah. commitment, putting people first. Yeah, that, those are very important yeah. uh, lessons. Marcos, um, you are following the RICO suit in the US in which uh, companies are taking, um, I think it's Greenpeace, uh, Earth First, and Banktrack to court and accusing them of inciting protests to increase donations. So basically, they are using litigation against environmental groups. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that uh, lawsuit, what's going on there? Sure. One of the, one of the risks that uh, environmental defenders are also facing is the risk of litigation against them. So the use of uh, lawsuits to try to silence them. And, yeah. and that is what we're seeing in the in the North Dakota pipeline situation. Some of you may recall the protest by Standing Rock, uh, the tribe, the Sioux, that were defending their right to water and their lands against the risks posed by the Dakota transfer pipeline. And uh, President Obama, after months of protest, uh, decided that um, he would um, study alternative routes. As we know, he, uh, Democrats lost the election, and in his first days of office, uh, President Trump uh, passed an executive order directing the Army Corps of Engineers to expedite this pipeline. And a couple months later, Trump's go-to lawyer, Mark Kasowitz, brought a RICO lawsuit against Greenpeace International, that's based here, Greenpeace yeah. US, and others, and there's uh, Jane and John Doe in the complaint for anyone that is willing to speak out on this case. 
Uh, is it a coincidence? Uh, probably not. But the, the, it's a $900 million lawsuit, uh, it, uh, the, the goal of which is really not money because the company knows it cannot and will not win that lawsuit. Instead, it wants that to divert attention, make the issue not about the standing rock and the defense of land and the environment or about its deleterious practices. It wants to make it about a lawsuit and it yeah. concocts this conspiracy theory and uses a statute, the RICO statute that was passed in the United States uh, at the federal level in 1970 to break down the mafia as if environmental organizations were somehow conspiring. But let's be clear, we are conspiring in defense of the environment. Uh, we are creating a movement and these lawsuits, they need to be recognized for what they are. An assault at freedom of expression, an attack against democracy. Organizations in the U United States working on environment, working on human rights are coming together. There was a strategy yeah. meeting last Tuesday and one of the things that came out of this is that we will not be silenced. We will not be intimidated. We will keep up uh, the, the fight uh, for yeah. uh, the environment. But these kinds of threats will cost the environmental groups resources, time, money, um, and that is what they will achieve in the end, right? That is their goal, to distract attention, to make organizations defend themselves instead of working on the issues that they are designed and coming together to work on. Yeah. Uh, so Greenpeace, uh, US, instead of working on the pipelines and its campaigns, is having to divert resources to defending itself. Yeah. And that is a, an important uh, uh, dimension to capture because uh, this, di this phenomenon of slap suits, that's the acronym for the strategic litigation against public participation, the, the attempt to silence environmental groups is not new. Uh, there ha it's been around for decades, but it has been under the uh, defamation statutes, yeah. um, usually at the state level. And many states in the United States have passed anti-slap suits. Yeah. So if a, if a complaint is clearly fake, as in fake news and fake lawsuits, then it will be kicked out and there will be sanctions against the complainant. Yeah. But not at the federal level no. and not with respect to RICO. So this is something new and in an age where apparently, and for some people, facts don't matter anymore, well, this is a real threat to activism that's based on credible reporting. But we can't retreat. We need to reaffirm basic principles of freedom of expression fact-based decision-making, rationality, science as a benchmark of intelligence and, and not, uh, yeah, not retreat. Yeah, thank you. I would like to move on to our next uh, topic, technology, and, and ask Lawrence to, to uh, uh, give us some input there. Um, you have, as mentioned before, uh, founded the Skyview Foundation. Um, and you know, using technology to protect endangered wildlife. You already uh, uh, told us a bit about that. Could you explain a bit more about how it works, what it exactly entails, and what kinds of opportunities you see there for the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we're, I got really excited about your uh, statement, by the way. So <laughs> fire in the belly. Yes. Let's do it. Um, so what we do with, with smart parks is we, we build our own uh, network within a, a wildlife reserve. So I, I strongly believe in proper law enforcement is, is really key to protecting uh, livelihoods for, for people, but also the livelihoods for the, uh, the animals. So what we do is we build our own cell phone towers, as you like, and it's based on a, on a LoRa uh, communication technology. And LoRa means that you can send small parts of data over a very long distance. So we started a small proof of concept in, in Tanzania. We built our own uh, network. And within that network, you can place different kind of sensors. So you can put sensors on the animals, you can put sensors on rangers, on vehicles, stuff like that. And with that, you can create situational awareness. So in the past, with drones, we found uh, rhino poachers and the rhino poachers got killed uh, yeah. because they were intervened by, uh, by the rangers. And that's not a situation you want to have. So what you want is you have more situational awareness so the management of the park can make proper decisions, okay, where do we need to enhance our security and stuff like that. So 
we did at small scale, and now mm -hmm. we've partnered up with, with African Parks, uh, which is a large organization in Africa, and we build it in Akajira and Rwanda, covering with only 12 cell phone towers, 1,200 uh, square kilometers, for a fraction of the price that you would need for uh, you know, proper cell phone uh, coverage. Yeah. And you know, we installed over 100 sensors, giving us 100,000 location updates a day, and, and this makes sure that we've reduced uh, not only in Mukamas in Tanzania, but also in Rwanda, that poaching has gone virtually to zero. Wow. And, and it's definitely not all to do with our technology solution, because it's a layer in all the different countries. You know, you need to involve the local community and all that kind of, uh, kind of stuff to really uh, eradicate the problem. But it's, it's one part of the solution. And uh, that's where we are now. We'll be going to Malawi and the WWF is funding our trip to, uh, to India Great. to do that as well. So you see that. 400 people are being killed there each year just because of the human wildlife conflict. Yeah, yeah. And looking at the future, what opportunities are still out there? Are we using every, the, all, the, all that technology has to offer, all potential for the future? No, I think there's much more. I actually envision like a kind of a Jurassic Park about, about without the dinosaurs and people getting killed. But, you know, using all different kind of technology, you can drones, um, better tracking software, smarter camera traps that you can all connect into a network that you can monitor from either a, a control station or back home. That's what we can do now in the Netherlands. We can track the rhino just through the Internet. It's very uh, layered encryption. But I can see where the rhinos are at this moment. And we've wow. got now five rhino in the Serengeti being followed. And yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff I strongly believe in is one part of keeping the animals safe. Yes. The, the images, I've seen the images on YouTube. They are really amazing. I would definitely recommend that uh, uh, as well. Uh, I'm trying to make a bridge here. <laughs> 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 so technology, because one, one of the um, uh, applications that you see quite often recently is using apps to mobilize the public in gathering evidence, gathering information to build a movement, uh, which is the next uh, topic that we would, uh, I would like to discuss with you. Um, Silas, uh, can we start with you? Um, you have lots of experience on working with local communities and, and empowering them, uh, strengthening them to uh, come up for themselves. Um, could you tell us how that process works, how you contact each other and, 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 and build something out of that? Well, <clears throat> most of the time, um, it's easier to sit in the capitals and uh, maybe fly <laughs> in and, and fly out to try to understand what's happening locally and then to launch uh, advocacy campaigns at the national or international level. Um, oftentimes, the missing piece is that the people who are affected by these uh, different uh, issues are not uh, brought into the picture. So you, you're speaking for them. You're going out and campaigning for them. If you want to change uh, the situation in countries like Liberia, like for example, um, where we don't have the leisure of uh, good court systems, so you can't go to uh, court because most of the judges are inherently corrupt. I shouldn't be saying that. But um, you can't get a, a fair hearing uh, in a courtroom. Um, the government is unwilling to implement its own laws. So you cannot go to the agencies that have the authority to do uh, what they are supposed to be doing. Therefore, you have to go back to basics. The people who are most affected, who have got a lot to lose, making them a part of that struggle. Yep. And we've seen that uh, work extremely well. Um, because what we, we are finding is that uh, what they lack most is the public exposure mm -hmm. to be able to speak about their situation. Mm -hmm. The example you gave about Shell, bringing community uh, people from Nigeria into the Netherlands to stand up in the courtroom and tell the story is very different. Um, to an expat uh, talking about their experience in Nigeria in the courtroom here. Um, and so by bringing those villagers, uh, most of the people who work with are in remote areas, bringing them into the capital, some of them for the first time, taking them to the legislature and sitting in the same room with them and de making demands on them, for some of them to walk away and, uh, and say, I didn't think that was possible. Mm -hmm. um, in one particular instance, and uh, we, we, that's the communities whose story we are going to be looking at later on uh, today, 
tonight is that we actually took them from the community level and worked our way up through the government, and they actually sat down with the president in her office and said to her, Madam President, we do not appreciate the company working in our community, mm -hmm. and we will not allow them to take any more of our land. Yeah. That was a very powerful message. Yeah. And thereafter, it changed the entire dynamics. Um, the company suddenly realized that um, if the communities could make their way up the chain to the office of the president, um, they therefore had to take them a bit more seriously than they did before. So I think uh, bringing the people themselves who are impacted by these uh, very difficult situations together, giving them an uh, opportunity to speak out for themselves and facilitating them to engage the powers that be can yeah. make a lot of difference. Yeah. Donald, um, you have a lot of campaigning experience as well, building uh, movements, um, and you're nodding to his story. Could you share with us what, what it is that you recognize? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's of course interesting to, to see so many uh, commonalities uh, while we live in totally different countries, that, that totally different continents and uh, cultures. Um, in our uh, clean air uh, court case, we used a similar approach uh, because there wasn't objective scientific ev evidence available mm -hmm. um, proving that uh, the air is unhealthy or polluted. So we had uh, citizen sci scientists. Uh, we provided uh, people in polluted areas yeah. with a, a, a very simple technology in which they could measure their own uh, air quality. And we would then uh, gather that and then send it to a, a scientific laboratory and they would analyze it. And we used that in the court case and the judge recognized uh, uh, that. So uh, it's very powerful to, to use technology in combination with people. And to be honest, we are very much inspired by what Silas and his uh, uh, colleagues did in Liberia. Uh, and as uh, friends of the Earth Netherlands, Milieu Defensi, we are now working together with a a number of offices in the Friends of the Earth Network globally to uh, duplicate the, his approach in the, the rest of the world um, in order to use, he, he, he developed together with, uh, with colleagues, an, an app, an application mm -hmm. for smartphone in which you could monitor what uh, companies and government uh, does in terms of deforestation and uh, misuse of power uh, and centralize that in, onto a um, uh, internet platform, and we are now doing that, applying that in other countries in the world. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very uh, interesting. Um, just wondering um, if you look at all the environmental campaigns that you have witnessed in your uh, life as a campaigner, and not just uh, the ones of Mio Defensi, are there any campaigns out there that you would really consider as a failure? Um, just did not work well. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, and when you speak of failures, uh, of course, there's always people involved, so I need to be a bit uh, objective, but at, at still I'm, I'm reflecting on uh, what, uh, what the environmental movement in general uh, have been doing, and myself in different roles. And I would say, in the Netherlands, our biggest failure is the, the conviction of the Dutch government and the role NGOs, as some NGOs have prayed, prayed, uh, played in that uh, conviction, of voluntary measures, okay. um, certification, uh, roundtables. Uh, and that has been an, an important obstacle in getting real change. Because as long as uh, government believes and acts upon that belief that companies will take action themselves without um, legal frameworks, they don't take the action to develop those legal frameworks. And unfortunately, in the Netherlands, this, this vision of voluntary measures is very dominant. Can you name one example? Um, yeah, uh, you could say in soy, the, import, the, the production and import of soy and palm oil yeah. are good examples in which it's clear that it's enormously destructive of both the uh, ecology. Uh, deforestation uh, is driven by uh, the need to develop uh, plantations for soy and palm oil. Um, and 
communities that depend on uh, the forest also lose their livelihoods, uh, their, their home, if you want, if when people live in the, the forest. And uh, a large part of that is driven by the fact that government just doesn't take action because mm -hmm. they believe what companies tell them. Leave us, give us a bit of space, we will self-regulate. Um, and that is, that, that is absolutely destructive. Yeah. Yeah, that, it's, it's a political answer. I was expecting a juicy story about a campaign <laughs> going horribly wrong, but <laughs> you're not going to give there, that. There are many okay. uh, NGOs that do campaign on voluntary <laughs> measures, I'm afraid. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, we would like to open the floor to have your questions. Oh, and well, okay, I don't have to uh, force anyone. That's good. Uh, could you please um, uh, stand up and state your, state your name? That might help. Gert-Jan van Dommelen, uh, from the town called Huizen, east of Amsterdam. Um, the question was clear. Have you made any failures on your own campaigns? And by the way, I think that voluntary measures of companies are always to be uh, rewarded. But um, in my history, milieu defense has always been like a crime, a criminal organization themselves. So my image of milieu defense is very wrong. Uh, what have you done to fix that? Oh, wow. To the, make the, it positive, eh? Because the, 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 the young people think of the of... defense as very positive. <laughs> and I'm an old guy. And I think, gosh, back in the 70s, you were not that, uh, that friendly. <laughs> <laughs> the public perception. But, but your perception changed. <laughs> He's trying. So, 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 so we haven't uh, been successful uh, uh, in that. <laughs> No, indeed, I, I'd say milieu defence, and, and it's maybe uh, a news, newsworthy for, for our foreign guests, <laughs> in, in the Netherlands we're, are sometimes seen now. by, by, by uh, some parts of the population as being close to criminal. Um, and of course, it's incomparable to what's happening to our, our colleagues in, uh, in Latin America and Africa. I don't want to compare it in any way when you lose your life or uh, like like uh, Bertha being shot, uh, it, it's incomparable. But in the Netherlands, in the at, during the last elections, one party, the Liberal Party, included a reference in their political program that they want to take away the tax status of uh, NGOs. Now, like I say, it's incomparable to what uh, what's happening in Latin America. Mm -hmm. But in it, it is a first step in trying to limit the the space and activity of. Uh, of an NGO like uh, like Milieu Defensing, because we are dependent, like I said, it costs us a million euro to do a, a, yeah. a litigation. If we don't, if people cannot give us money or they feel uh, limited in doing that. Um, but I'd say um, uh, probably what a, a big change uh, for Milieu Defensing, and I'm, I'm director since two, two years, is uh, we. Um, uh, the, the major, active, major change that I've introduced is what we called eerlijk omschakelen, which is comparable to uh, um, a just transition. Whereas previously, and that I see as a, as a uh, you could see it as a failure. Previously, for us, the environment was something about emissions, uh, emissions of CO2 or emissions of uh, uh, methane, or, and that's what we campaigned on. We want CO2 reductions. And now we made the shift in which we say people should always be the center of an environmental campaign. Not the CO2 reduction is the center, but the yeah. people that live in houses that need to be insulated or need to get access to green energy. We're not campaigning against farmers anymore, but we are saying we are fighting with farmers for a fair price for sustainable products, which uh, is very similar to the movie you uh, uh, just sent. So for us, when we now campaign, the central piece is not anymore a tree or a, 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 a polluting factory. For us, our picture will be people that participate in getting a cleaner environment for them and their communities. In, in a legal way? In a legal uh, way. Uh, 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 yeah, it depends on what you see as legal. Uh, yeah. we, it was we, necessary. Uh, we, we are living on the, on the legal edge. Looking, the, looking for the boundaries of yeah, the law. We are, we are indeed testing the boundaries. Okay. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Thank you. Yes. I think it's funny we're sitting next to each other because I think we're coming from um, almost opposite perspectives. Um, 
because I, I had, um, when I was hearing you all speak, um, um, also in the context of this, uh, this weekend, that it's about Human Rights Watch, which adheres to, um, it's, it's very much about law. Um, and you were speaking about indigenous communities, um, and I was just thinking about how often indigenous people um, are the ones that are at the forefront of environmental um, uh, movements, and that they are often at odds um, with the nation state. So thinking about even you know the existence of things like borders. Um, so on a very fundamental level, in in my conception of a lot of uh, environmental movements, it's important to um, kind of contextualize and see law not as just the ethical standard, but perhaps a method uh, through which you can achieve environmental justice. Um, so I'm wondering whether you all have some, um, um, maybe some alternative models for achieving environmental uh, justice outside the law, um, since I don't think in a, well, I hope that long term um, that the nation state as a model will disappear, um, uh, including capitalism, et cetera. Um, so I, I would hope that people like people like you are also working on ways to achieve uh, environmental justice, uh, ecological justice um, outside the law, which also, often also has to be, um, you know, you need lawyers, you need a certain literacy and an understanding of how the law works and, and, and what, what language is being spoken to even access um, those, uh, those ways of achieving justice. So what are some maybe inclusive ways for people that are not trained in law um, to be activists, um, maybe outside the law in ways that are deemed illegal, including being Working illegal. outside the law as a yeah. sort of summary, if you will. Who, who wants to answer that question? Oh, I love working outside the law. Um, <laughs> so I, I, th I, th I th I'm not quite sure if I completely understand you, because there is always a way to be an activist. And, and you don't necessarily need a law uh, for that. Even even if you look in the Netherlands, you can, you know, there's, uh, we're talking about foreign issues here, uh, mostly except for the the, the, the clean air uh, in the Netherlands. But we have Gen X, which is poisoning our rivers in the in the Netherlands. And then I'm wondering, where are the faces? Why is no one protesting protesting there mm -hmm. every single day to make that stop? You know, mm -hmm. those are the issues we need to face. And this has nothing to do with law. It's, it's our environment. We just need to stop it. Yeah. We need to be there every day, yeah. present, stopping those trucks or whatever coming into that, uh, maybe slightly breaking the law here, but I'm here with a criminal organization, <laughs> future president of Liberia. So why not? <laughs> and, uh, but. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's what I'm, I'm missing, and that's where you can be an activist. But even besides that, you know, just be an activist every day by, by starting with a plant-based diet, you're inducing your fruit print and, and, uh, and eat less meat. That's where you can be an activist. It's, it's not something you become or you use the law for. It's what you live, breathe every day. That's my answer. Marcus, you have a response on that? Well, I'd like to add the idea that uh, there is the distinction between legality and, and legitimacy. And often we see the laws that are unfair, unjust, and inequi inequitable. And we campaign against those laws. Uh, and we utilize the international human rights framework to do so. Uh, we, uh, a couple of months ago, put out a report that shows how uh, Russia is abusing its foreign agent's law to silence the environmental movement. So that's perfectly legal under Russian legal system, but certainly completely incompatible with human rights guarantees of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. And that needs to be denounced. And so the, the, the distinction between legality and legitimacy, I think, is an important one to keep in mind there. But you also asked about indigenous peoples finding themselves at odds with the state. Uh, indigenous people uh, generally are deeply integrated with their environment. And so that means that attacks against the environment are attacks against their cultural integrity or their physical integrity. Uh, individual and community rights coming together. And nowhere is this clearer, for example, in situations where, um, say, a protected area for environmental biodiversity can result in the exclusion of traditional uses by indigenous peoples. A couple of weeks ago, to be specific, uh, give an example, uh, in, in, in Peru, uh, the environment minister and the president signed a decree creating a new national park, almost a million hectares in deep in the Amazon. So who would not celebrate that? It's rhetorical and the designation <laughs> of national park means that the 
there are five people, indigenous peoples, uh, that uh, were using the park for hunting, for uh, fishing, for timber, and now will they be, is this a new enclosure? The organization that coordinates indigenous peoples in Peru, IDESEP, has come out and made a strong pronouncement in an open letter to a Peruvian president saying, we want for these uses to be respected. We are, this land is sacred for us. We are for biodiversity conservation, but it doesn't have to come at the expense of our rights. And they are threatening with another Amazonazo, which as you may recall from 2009 in the incidents in Bagua, there was bloodshed after the administration of Alan Garcia at the time in Peru tried to open up the Amazon for further investments in oil, gas, mining. We don't want another bloodshed. Uh, there has to be a way of reconciling these interests. The Peruvian law so allows that, but yet the interpretation, so this is, again, the technicalities, and we do need lawyers for that, uh, then to navigate that legitimacy, legality, dichotomy. Thank you. May I? Sure. Just one, because your question is, what can, what can common people do uh, if you do not have the interest or the resources to uh, litigate? And I would say our biggest strength as citizens in confronting capital, because we can never, never confront them in terms of what they are powerful at, having money. Now, uh, a, 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 sh a company like Shell has a, a GDP or a, a turnover that's comparable to three times the GDP of the Netherlands. Impossible to confront them on what they are powerful. What we have is the strength of, of people. Bringing people together is what we, uh, that is our most important uh, uh, means of achieving change. Uh, if we can get enough people to, to work together in all different manners, that is uh, our, our, uh, our, our movement, our movement for change. And I'll give you one example uh, in which we are, have been active. Uh, and that is the, the pressure on the Dutch government to take leave from gas, uh, natural gas. We have been working in uh, the province of Groningen uh, that many of you now have been hit with uh, the problems of gas exploitation. For, for decades. And uh, recently there's been a demonstration after years of smaller small demonstrations getting bigger and bigger of 10,000 um, citizens getting together and demanding change. Uh, the day before yesterday, more than 100 farmers with, tr uh, with tractors from, uh, from the province came to the Netherlands, or to, the, to the capital, The Hague, to demand change. And the minister went to meet with, uh, with them. And these are all illustrations, and I can, I, it's the same with, uh, with my colleague with uh, Silas from uh, Liberia. What he did there, what his, his success was, is empowering people by bringing them uh, uh, together. Because that, in the end, is, is, is our power, people power. Wow, that is inspiring. Um, other questions? Um, I have a question for Donald Pols. Uh, you just mentioned as a failure um, uh, the voluntary business model of, um, yeah, the Netherlands kind of the approach of business. Um, I was wondering, I'm myself a master's student um, in uh, international public law, and I wonder why you see it as a failure because, um, um, yeah, no, I just wonder why I see it as a failure, because it's really an, one kind of approach, and I, I guess the European Union and also the United Nations, their main way of dealing with it, so, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll answer it in, in two ways. One is uh, objective, and the other is philosophical. Uh, objectively, the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, the voluntary approach has dominated the, the government uh, approach, and objectively, the Netherlands is one of the most polluting countries in uh, the, the world in the OECD. So clearly our approach has not worked. The second is more philosophical. Um, and that is that unsustainability, the lack of sustainability is the externalization of cost. So what a company does is it in internalizes the profit. It wants to make profit. So it takes all the profit. In. And all cost, if it's labor cost or uh, cost of protecting the environment or whatever, 
that they tried to push onto society by not paying for the pollution. So, for example, CO2, if a company pollutes, they doesn't want to pay the cost of, of uh, the CO2, but we as a society have to pay for raising the dikes. The same with uh, um, uh, air pollution. company doesn't pay the cost, but we as a society pay the cost of people having a lack of health and going to hospital because of that. So it's a, a socialized cost. A company, if they internalize costs, it becomes more expensive for them. If they have to take all types of measures to not pollute, they have to they take, cost money. They have to buy uh, different equipment, invest in, in uh, filters, etc. Uh, that makes their products more expensive. If their competitors do not do the same, uh, the company that internalizes costs becomes more expensive and lose market share. That, so it's a, a, a market failure, and the only, uh, only body that can address market failure is government by making laws that are applicable to all companies, and that is why a regulation is better than voluntary measures. I just can I say one more thing sure. about that? Okay, so um, don't you think then that if you have a law, I mean we have laws, and they often like many um, businesses don't live up to their obligations. And if you talk about a corporation like Shell, they have enough money to go to court and to sue, yeah, have a suit for 10 years. So mm. do you think it makes a change, really? Or is it more a way of dealing with the problem afterwards? Government regulation can ensure that the company produces in a more uh, sustainable manner. So it, is, it can address, depends on, of course, what type of litigation you have, uh, legal framework you have, uh, can ensure that uh, production takes place in a more clean manner. Of course, a, a very common example is the fact that we are now, that cars have become more cleaner because of government regulation. There's one question in the back. Uh, it's more like a follow-up question. Are you in dialogue with our government about the need uh, for more regulations? Because um, it is a while ago, but I worked as an intern at our government of uh, foreign affairs, and they often asked NGOs to come up with uh, the legal framework or the, the framework in which government uh, civil society and organization should work so yes yeah yes we do we participated in the energy agreement uh, uh, in the of the previous government and, and now in the new cabinet uh, the energy agreement is a, an agreement between different stakeholders uh, to uh, achieve a re reduction of greenhouse gases and we'll do the same uh, in the new uh, under the new government but I'd say what is um, what is the biggest challenge is not necessarily national regulation. Uh, through globalization and the rise of multinationals, companies have become so big that it's impossible for one uh, government to regulate a company. So they, they play out countries against each other, uh, tell a, a government if you increase your, uh, the quality of your environmental laws, we'll go to, because it'll, it'll increase the cost, we'll go to another country. So what we have now been working together with an, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, NGOs uh, internationally is on a UN uh, declaration for human business and human rights, in which we, the, the, the rationale is because of globalization and because of multinationals and the fact that national com governments cannot regulate effectively anymore, we need an international agreement mm -hmm. on regulating the human rights impacts of, uh, of business. And in March, uh, there will be the next, uh, next meeting, and a number of us uh, will be there. And we can all push the Dutch government to vote in favor of, uh, of this human right, a business and human rights uh, declaration of the UN. Okay. I have a follow-up question on, on this, but I'd like to give you the room as well. Anyone? Oh, two questions. Hey. Um so the way I see one of the big problems which uh, may or may not be relevant today is uh, also the fact that the general population has been uh, reduced to consumers. Mm -hmm. Like consumerism, in my opinion, is a huge problem. 
And I think uh, if all of us just live in a very extractive economy where we just like use and dispose, we will always continue this problem of extracting, whether it's timber or oil. And there will be a lot of, uh, whether it's First Nations or whether it's our doorstep in the future, we will always suffer from that. And I just kind of want to get your opinion on, yeah, as environmental activists, where do you stand and what do you think we can do about that as well? Thank you. That was actually my follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> the role of consumers, and also particularly interested in your view, Silas, about how you think uh, consumers around the world could help your cause. Well, I think uh, a starting point would be um, individual consumers making very conscious decisions about the products that they buy. Um, and you don't have to make a very big, complex analysis to arrive at the type of choices you make. Um, for example, if one of the things that we uh, found very uh, useful is that if you can show or if there's sufficient information uh, that makes you aware that company A in its practices Oversee yeah. um, is violating human rights, not uh, abiding by environmental uh, regulations, and they are putting their products out there. I think um, we as individuals have a responsibility to refuse yeah. to buy uh, those commodities. Yeah. And that's where your example about the uh, European Union timber regulation becomes extremely important. So in a country like Liberia, for example, where, uh, as I said, the government is oftentimes unwilling to implement its own laws, to enforce its own laws. Yeah. Um, timber companies are having to think twice about sending their products to Europe because the market is turning its back yeah. on illegal uh, yeah. timber. That's a, big, that's a very big step. Um, there are those who will argue that, well, you know, they will simply ship their products to Asia where, you know, the Chinese or the Malaysians or the whoever's there will open their arms to that. But I think, um, again, looking at products, then you make a very conscious yeah. decision about products, you know, from China, for example. Um, do you allow for Liberian timber to be laundered through that chain, and then you are very comfortable with uh, your, your, uh, furniture from, from China, or are you going to ask some very hard questions about their sourcing practices? Yeah. So I think individual uh, consumers have a responsibility to make very so uh, good decisions. To make it very concrete, which companies should we be boycotting? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give a, a previous example uh, because that's easier um, in my current uh, situation. <laughs> Politician. <laughs> um, I think for many years we campaigned that uh, timber from Liberia was contributing to the human suffering that was happening. Yeah. Uh, the companies were financing Malaysia, they were helping to facilitate arms import. So the Oriental Timber Company, which uh, Gus Van Coehoven was uh, uh, the most senior uh, figure, um, was at the center of all of that. So Europeans were aware, because Greenpeace, Global Witness, ourselves, we were tracking the timber from Liberia into the European market. No. Um, and I think when that information became public, then uh, those that were procuring timber for Liberia had a responsibility to say we will no longer buy that timber. Yeah, yeah. All right. We are running out of time. Uh, okay, last question perhaps. <laughs> okay, my, my name is Shaker. And, and, and sorry, just really quick answer, whoever is okay. going to answer the question. My name, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. My name is Shaker, and I, I represent Stop Ecoside uh, Foundation. It's a st Dutch thing. And we are working on the idea of a, a law of ecocide because you're all talking about international uh, gaps, international uh, problems of being able to prosecute or criminalize major crimes uh, that are related to the environment. I want to know what, what your opinion is uh, and also whether what can be done to progress that. Thank you. Very briefly, a response? Yes, I want a law on ecocide, but 
I think you're a better Good, person Good short to... response, though. Well, I would echo the, your uh, assertion that there are significant gaps in the international legal system that need to be addressed. Donald spoke about the Treaty on Accountability for Corporations. There is still no global recognition of the right to a healthy environment. And the law on ecocide may be that frontier. I was moved last year in The Hague where the International Tribunal on Monsanto, this was a people's tribunal, an opinion tribunal was formed, and it had an opinion that elaborated on these gaps and pointing out how that body of law would make a difference in stopping certain practices that will harm not only our generation, but further generations to come. Thank you. I, we, I'm sorry, we have to wrap up because we're running out of time. I'm going to do, try to do a recap quickly of what we just, uh, the, the lessons learned during this session. Um, Marcos, you shared with us um, uh, what we're facing today, the environmental uh, challenges, and how this is related to human rights, and how environmental activists uh, are facing pressure, uh, threats, violence, and that is increasing. And you gave us some reasons three reasons at least why that is the case, including one being uh, uh, corruption. Uh, I'm not going to state the other two. Uh, you, you've also had the chance to meet um, four activists um, uh, live in person and, and hear about their motivations uh, and also their commitment to this cause. That was at least inspiring to me and I hope to you as well. And we have uh, uh, explored some uh, uh, challenges and opportunities in terms of tools, litigation, lengthy process, could have uh, great outcomes, extremely expensive, and could also be used against you. Um, technology, a lot can still be achieved. Uh, there are lots of opportunities. And when it comes to mobilizing people, it's important to recognize them, make it an inclusive process. Uh, 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 they, they should have a role in this. And uh, we should be aware of our power as citizens and as consumers. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your Saturday afternoon uh, with us. I hope the session was uh, useful to you. As mentioned before, the film Silas is going to be aired uh, uh, right across this hall at 8.30, and it's going to be a Q&A with Marcos and Silas himself. Uh, really, you should definitely go there. It's, it's, it's a beautiful documentary. And last but not least, I would like to thank our panelists of the day for being willing to share your thoughts, ideas, doubts, and challenges uh, with us. Thank you very much. Can we come? Thank you.